it's 10.02, uh, excuse me, 1.02. And I'm calling the meeting to order for the Board of Trustees um, for the Vermont State College System, October 25th. Uh, as a housekeeping note, we have a link to sign up to provide public comment. It's available on the agenda, published on the VSC website, and there's a link posted in the chat. And uh, Jen will be in charge of that when the time comes. Uh, we have approval of minutes from September 20th, September 21st, and September 29th. Uh, we'll start with the September 20th. I need a motion to approve the minutes um, as presented. Do I see a motion for that? Uh, I'll move that. Okay, Sean moves that a second. Second. Second, okay. Um, any comments or questions on the minutes of September 20th that was presented? Hearing none, all those approved, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Pro opposed? Okay, then we have the minutes of September 21st. So uh, this moved. Was, okay, we have a so moved to accept. Uh, second. Second. Okay, any questions or discussions on that? Seeing none, um, hearing none, uh, all those in favor of approving those minutes, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, we also have the September, tw September 29th minutes of a special board meeting. It was a listening session. Uh, any any uh, motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Second. Okay, Sue, second. Okay, we've got that moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion or comments on that? Hearing none, we're going to vote on that. Anyone who, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, okay. We have a report from the DEI committee, which met on October 15th. Uh, Shirley Jefferson was, is the chairman of that committee and uh, I'll turn that over to you, Shirley, so you can present your committee report, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon. The Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee met on October the 15th, 2021, and we have two action items for the board to consider today. Our first action item is that we recommend the board to adopt the anti-racism pledge proposed by the VSCS Student Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. And that uh, pledge is, is in, uh, on page 16 and 19 in the uh, meeting material. Uh, we have invited the task force here today uh, to speak to you on why they, they were working on this pledge and why it's important to each one of them that we adopt this uh, pledge. So uh, I believe that there are several members here today. I did see Say Sabra Ann and I think I see Devin. If, if they could uh, give us about a five or six minute, minute presentation, and I believe that we'll take questions if that's okay uh, with the chair. So if you could please uh, talk to us today. And first I wanna say thank you all for coming. And I know that you all have been working on this pledge for about a year. So thank you all for coming here today. Thank you so much for having us. Good afternoon, everyone. We are the Student Diversity and Inclusion Task Force representing each campus of the Vermont State College System. My name is Devin Thompson. I'm from MBU Johnson. I'm the SGA Vice President, the leader of the Coalition of Minority Students Organization, and I'm the MBU Johnson Women's Basketball Team Captain. My name is Kevin McGreal. Uh, I'm a CCV student and the leader of the Student Advisory and Leadership Council. And I am student representative on the Academic Council and the DEI Committee at CCV. Uh, my name is Cynthia Watkins. I'm a student on the Vermont Technical College in Randolph, and I'm a student athlete as well here on campus. Brian. Uh, say, Brian, you're, 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 you're muted. 
Thank you. Sorry. My name is Sabra Ann. I'm a new alum of NBU Linden and so former member of the President's Student Advisory Council and former president of the Cultural Ambassador Society. And I, I see that Ty J. Edwards just joined as well. I don't know, Ty J, if, if you want to introduce yourself. You're on mute as well, Ty J. I said, unfortunately, I'm in a circumstance where I'm traveling still, but my name is <laughs> Tajay Edwards. I'm the president of the NWACP chapter at Casting University. And I've been proud to be a part of this um, meaningful and very important cause. Thank you. As you all know, we are presenting not only to the Vermont State College DEI committee, but also with the Vermont State College trustees, the chancellor, and other members of the Vermont college system. We understand that negotiations can be difficult, especially in the case of discussing the need to dismantle racism. But as it was recently said, the time for wordsmithing is done. The time for moving forward is today. We would like to reiterate the value and benefits of accepting this pledge for all within the Vermont State College system. This pledge helps build the foundation for equitable Vermont education. It is meant to serve as another tangible tool in providing and pursuing higher education, which is one of the core missions of this institution. And our efforts have not progressed alone. We've worked with professors and staff across the VSCS, as well as known social justice advocates, Nevin Capel and Chief Don Stevens. Each of us has made public outreach efforts to connect with both students and each campus SGA. And more recently, this pledge was accepted to move forward to you today by the Board of Trustees DEI Committee. We say this to demonstrate just how many people support the adoption of this anti-racism pledge and how easy it was to work together to make this great initiative possible. We believe the pledge will benefit all within the VSC. There are still several things to fine tune, such as the logistics of launching this pledge and maintaining its analysis and accountability. That is why we all are here today. The adoption of this pledge will, will publicly uh, codify the DEI focus objectives and transformation already taking place across all the campuses of the VSC. We would like to take a moment, uh, as we did with the DEI committee, to read the pledge aloud to you. So we, the members of the Vermont State College System, acknowledge that we must implement and protect educational opportunities for all cultures and their histories. To protect all community members from social, academic, and systemic harm, we must initiate progressive standards and actions that promote respect for all people from all cultural backgrounds. Anti-racism is the practice of equitably advocating for all races by working to address and dismantle racism within ourselves and our society through intentional and sustained actions that challenge and change racist ideas, policies, behaviors, and beliefs. Anti-racism is a constant educational process. It questions why power is held within the hands that it is, where within us and within our systems these structures manifest, and how we can change these dynamics to create more equitable systems for all people. Here on original Abenaki and other indigenous people's lands in the state of Vermont, we are not insulated from the plights of racism. Education provides greater opportunities to those who are able to access its benefits. Education is a key area where educational institutions make it a priority to act on core human values where both students and employees feel safer and supported. This is essential in providing, pursuing, and achieving higher levels of education. As members of the VSCS, we pledge to continue building equitable education experiences for all members of our community. We must actively involve every student, educator, administrator, alum, and policymaker within the system to help make changes for our future. 
We must also educate the communities in which we live for the impact of this work does not end at the classroom door nor the state borders. So we pledge to commit to this process. We pledge to provide equitable opportunities for all to achieve a higher education free from harm and discrimination based on race, ethnicity, or culture. Listen to and respond to voices of those who are oppressed and actively speak out against racism and call in our peers when they display racist behaviors, even when it is uncomfortable or inconvenient. Our call to action as a member of this, in, this educational institution, I pledge to advocate for the implementation of the following actions. Provide and endorse diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice training for all employees and provide educational resources on these topics to all students. Support the integration of DEI education into all general education courses, as well as programming for all incoming and transfer students, including the first year seminars with the purpose of educating students about social justice with a specific emphasis on anti-racism. Provide dedicated safe spaces, support systems, and wellness resources for students of color and allies of students of color. Directly and clearly inform first year and transfer students of the BSC policies and procedures regarding discrimination and harassment. Consistently inform all members of the community of such policies. And create a system-wide racial equity audit to be performed and assessed regularly, including a review of the processes through which community members report issues and an annual assessment of the progress of these commitments. So with this pledge, we come together to not only understand ourselves and each other better, but equally to respect, listen to, and learn from one another. I, along with the VSCS and all its members, agree to reject racism in all its forms by educating ourselves about the history of and continued impact of racism. We can strengthen our efforts to work against racist beliefs and actions. I am committed to fostering safe, diverse, and inclu inclusive campuses for all people who are a part of and interact with the Vermont State College System. It is our hope that the Board of Trustees will join us and all those who have shown and spoken for their support for the anti-racism pledge, benefiting the future of the entire Vermont State College System and all those within it. So thank you all for your time. Okay, Madam Chair. Then you're muted. Unmute, there I am. Okay, I just wanted to say if there were any other questions or concerns or discussion on this uh, topic. I was, um, uh, I was wondering if I could um, make a few statements while we're public like this, uh, just to give some broader context to this work that we're doing and how it um, affects everything going on in the state and the country. Would that be okay? Take a minute. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. So thinking about what's going on in Vermont, um, the I think there's more to consider um, with some of the issues that's going on. It's not just talking about, you know, um, the racism that's happening on campuses. When we're looking at the bigger picture of Vermont, you know, I know there's legislators here. We're looking at the future of, of our, our state and how we can attract more people and support the people that are here so they can stay. And we can have a population that's diverse and continues to grow. Um, and with this institution covering the whole state, the work that we do in these areas has a huge effect on the communities in which we are, which we are located, which is why we talk about that in the pledge. And I think we really need to think about 
um, as we implement this, how we can bring this conversation into these communities, because, you know, we can do these policy changes and work on from, you know, top down. But if we don't support that with a foundation of building new culture and having these conversations with our neighbors and in our, uh, you know, in our school board meetings and town hall meetings, um, like Trustee Jefferson was saying, like getting out into the communities and taking this work as an educational tool to talk about these issues that are happening and how we can support people and coming together, um, we're, we're not going to see this meaningful change. So that's why I just want everyone to really think about moving forward, how we can bring this work into the broader community. And I think Vermont has a really unique opportunity with our size um, that we can actually create a blueprint on how to take this integrated institutional structure and reform and bring that to our wider population to move forward to create a more equitable society for everyone. So I just think, you know, in doing this work, it's not just about supporting just students, but what it means for social welfare in general and the progression of, of our society. Um, any other discussion or questions on this? Uh, I just want to emphasize. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, it's go ahead. yeah um, so I had a question about, um, I think someone said the logistics have been, all been figured out, but I, I understand from what you're saying, this would be a pledge that would be signed by employees as well as students. And my question is, what are the consequences or implications if someone chooses not to sign? So those are great questions. And in our public outreach through talking with our campus presidents, staff, professors, employees, peers that are classmates, friends, you name it, um, and also a few members of the DEI committee and the chancellor, we have been asked these questions. So that's in the phase that we're hoping to enter next. And so in our conclusion, we were mentioning that we haven't actually accomplished these logistics. Um, so there are things to fine tune is what we had said, and we're fully aware of these. And that is part of what the reason of many reasons of why we're here today. We, the students have the power to do the public outreach, get the support and demonstrate to you just how many people and entities want this to happen. We need the support of the board of trustees, the state college system to help us launch this, to help this make it sustainable and accessible. So those things still need to be worked out. And we are hoping that not only will others be willing to join us in the work, we're hoping that we'll be invited as well. So we're hoping that those steps will come forward next. I would also like to add on top of Sabre's good points, sustainability concerns have been considered and addressed. As Sabre said, we're hoping to reach that next step after today. We think it's best to hire a dedicated DEI coordinator to oversee annual administration of the pledge, data collection, you know, our calls to action being met. And in regards to the accountability process for when discrimination is experienced even after the pledge, yes, we do have policy 311 and 311A. We would love for this pledge to be an additional step to 311 and 311A. We would like for it to be added as an educational opportunity. When this pledge is implemented, we have the opportunity to not only educate our communities on how the actions done are painful, but how the safety of every student, faculty, and staff shouldn't be compromised. We have the opportunity to create an educational turning point for the Vermont State College system. Any other questions? Janet, do you have any more? Go ahead. Yeah, I think so. Thank you for your answer. I think um, I'm not sure what is going to be specifically asked of the trustees. Um, and I think it's possible to be supportive of the content of the pledge, but being concerned about the logistics steps and what those look like. Um, either from a, um, you know, what, what are the consequences? Um, how does this impact academic debate? Um, you know, what, what academic debate is considered racist versus um, intellectual? I, you know, th so there's things that come in my mind that I think there's just a difference to me of uh, being able to support this direction, but being um, really wanting to understand some of the thorny, uh, logistics and enforcement or whatever issues um, to, 
to fully see this through because I think they they matter. Absolutely, and there are no. Oh, please, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, uh, the thorny issues are really important, and that's actually really reassuring because I've heard in across, you know, within the transformation, these conversations are already taking in place. Um, like what the things that we're saying in our call to action is actually work that's happening on many different levels in our colleges. Um, the idea of having this pledge, it's not a legally binding document. Like we can't create curriculum requirements based on that. We've explored that and the issues with unions and all this other stuff. Um, you know, that needs to be worked out and is being worked out already without this pledge being in place. Um, having this pledge though is creating a um, a shared language and dialogue that we can have and an open statement that we say, okay, these issues are happening. We're hearing this from students. We know that this need is there. So we are committing publicly to these, these transformation changes that we're, that we're um, approaching. And it can serve as a tool to, um, to ground people in this work and to um, be hold each other accountable. It's like, hey, we made these agreements to this. We can check check on this. It's a, it's coming together as a com community more as like a legally binding, you know, policy piece. Absolutely. There's no. Oh, I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry, Madam. I would okay. like to emphasize yeah. there are no Go consequences. Ahead, quickly. Thank you. There are no consequences as to if you don't want to sign or not. As Kevin said, this is an opportunity again to create that education, to start that conversation. Thank you, Madam. OK, thank you. Pat Moulton, please. Thank you. I just wanted to add that I think this is the beginning of a lot of work that still needs to happen. This is this is sort of the tip of the iceberg, as I characterized it during DE, the DEI committee. I mean, we need to get structures in place to know how to address occurrences of racism. To how, what exactly is our training and education program going to look like? And, and answering a lot of those thorny questions that you were correctly asking, Janet. So. I mean, I strongly encourage the board to adopt this pledge because we have a lot of work to do um, on all of our campuses and, and none of us are immune from this. But, but make no mistake, this is just the beginning, far, far, far from the end. And as my friend Shirley Jefferson told us when she came to visit, there is no end. Uh, this is a constant effort that you put in and a constant effort to change culture and help educate those who feel differently uh, and understand why they feel differently. So I appreciate your support. Thank you. Okay, Adam and then Bill. Hi, uh, thank you. So um, I, I support this. I think the, the it's not perfect. It's directional at this point. It's, it's not a policy, uh, but it, it makes a, a clear, strong statement. Um, that's that's frankly long overdue. Um, so I'm I'm in support of uh, approving this today. I also just wanted to um, expand on Kevin's comments about the value to the state as a whole. Are our businesses, other nonprofits, and organizations um, without the collective work that's gone into it and the ability to access that um, really struggle with with this having the resources and um, support to develop both a, a pledge a policy. Um, and documents from which to, to guide their future. So in, in regards to you know, the proposed audit, I think other organizations across the state will really be able to benefit from that work. Um, and I look forward to the uh, system being able to help share that. Thank you. Okay, Bill and then Tarjay. So uh, I went to, uh, as a member of the DEI committee, um, we heard from the students presenting uh, at greater length than we're going to hear today. Uh, and I want to assure the committee member or the other board of trustees that we asked the same, some of the same questions that you're asking, Janet, uh, and that uh, we felt very comfortable with uh, moving ahead with this pledge at this time. Uh, I see it as an educational opportunity for the entire system. Um, I also want to say that while I, uh, while I appreciate the emphasis on trying to impact the broader Vermont community and to say that the legislature, in my view, is embracing that uh, challenge at many different levels. And perhaps another time we can share more about what all the legislature has undertaken in that regard. I, I don't want us to uh, gloss over what was very, very impactful testimony to our committee about the actual hurts and harms 
that are actually taking place on our campuses at this time. That the, this pledge comes out of the personal experiences, the need for students uh, to feel safe, to feel uh, able to be supported, to be able to thrive uh, on our campuses, and that we have work to do there uh, that is in addition to uh, wrestling with any specific instances of discrimination or harm. But I think we as a board can embrace this uh, as an educational, as I say, as an educational uh, and aspirational opportunity. And I really want to, I want to say that as I, excuse my, pardon me, as I, uh, as, as you read the pledge aloud again, and I've read it numbers of times in, on the print, but as you read it aloud, I'm increasingly impressed with the depth and the uh, importance of the language that you have worked on and shared with us today. So I hope the board will move forward uh, in the spirit uh, that this is being offered. Thank you. Chair okay, Tarjay. So we've been working on this pledge for over a year and while um, we've been working tirelessly and effortlessly. We know the meaning behind the pledge, and we keep telling ourselves, like, uh, motivating each other, like, this pledge will never be perfect for everyone. We'll never have everything that everyone wants to be included, but we at least want to have the language that tells people um, that the racism is not tolerated here, and to show people of all different races that you're, you matter, um, you're safe here, and racism is not accepted here. So that's the main thing that we want right now. And a lot of people have contacted me before I even attended this meeting, like, Tajay, you got this, this needs to happen. So they're looking um, to you guys for the support. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to point out, I'm not a member of the DEI committee, but I did attend that meeting. And I believe one of the comments or questions was that this was a vol voluntary um, procedure for students Mm -hmm. and others. If I'm not correct, I believe that was questioned and answered at the time. Um, I also wanted, I think I uh, I think I also asked, or somebody asked about the consequences if someone did not agree to sign it. And I believe that it was stated there were no consequences. This was not gonna be an administrative record keeping thing. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to say as the chair of the board under the circumstances we've been operating under for the past couple, the last 18 months, I can't guarantee a coordinator is going to be hired. We have no idea what our financial situation is. We are, in, we are working very hard to try to keep our, our campuses open and our colleges open and continuing. Um, I particularly like the paragraph under education I think that applies to all of our students, regardless of where they come from or what we're doing. I think that is part of what we really want to do as an institution. And I like the last paragraph, basically where we, um, with this pledge, we come together to not only understand ourselves and each other better, but equally to respect, listen to, and learn from one another. I also have a thought, and I'm not sure that the members of the, of the committee, the students and their faculty necessarily think of it this way, but... I think um, diversity is not just the color of your skin. It's also, um, it's also a whole lot of other factors. And I think I also made this point that we're not monolithic. I think the Vermont State College system is probably one of the most diverse, is already diverse, very diverse, probably more so than many other colleges in Vermont. We, um, we have students from high school students to senior citizens in some courses. We only have adult students, mostly adult students that are non-traditional. We don't just have 18 to 22 year olds. Um, we have students from every corner of Vermont, from every kind of culture and ethnic and, and, and uh, societal level of, uh, that there is in Vermont. Everything from the, uh, all the economic and socioeconomic varieties of Vermont. We have it from small towns and farms and up to the suburban kids from Chittenden County. And, and a lot of these towns may look like we're all the same, but we're not. And so there are very distinct differences and quite frankly, there's a lot of Vermonters that cannot really afford to come here as much as we'd like to get them to come to education because we agree with you that education is really a great opportunity for people. Um, but we do have a high level of Pell eligible students and TRIO students, probably the highest in the state, the highest percentage in the state. And so I think that you know we have to be, when we talk about being respectful, I think it works for everybody. And I just wanna say that um, 
that I really like those pieces. Uh, is there any other discussion from anyone? Uh, go ahead, Sabra. I just wanted to simply add with all of those points you've brought up quite really important facts about the state of Vermont. I'm a non-traditional student, um, an orphan, a woman, uh, an invisible illness. I'm a biracial individual. And so I appreciate you, you know, signaling out what makes Vermont special and unique. And what I'd simply like to offer is with all of our diversity, all of the different cultures and heritage that make up Vermont, because it's several hundred years old, as far as, you know, since the 1500s, but then you think of the Abenaki cultures and everything just melding together today, here and now. Imagine what this pledge would do for the Vermont State College system and actually open stating we want to all come together and all lift each other and all work together. So I think this pledge would allow us to begin to um, pursue those directions and those paths more confidently and with each other. Yeah, I do have another question. Karen, Karen. has a hand up. Karen, go ahead. Who, Lynn, who has a hand Lynn, hand? A after you, Lynn, respectfully after you. No, you go You're first. Older. <laughs> You're older, you speak first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I did have a question. There's a, there's a one comment in here under the, we pledge to commit to this process where it talks that we're gonna call out our peers when they display racist behaviors. What exactly does that mean? Can someone from the committee talk about that? Yes, thank you. A uh, call out is just another term to say, you know, address the behaviors. Oftentimes, you know, on the Johnson campus and others, we often turn a blind eye to discriminative practices and racist behavior. You know, we take it lightly. We call them microaggressions. This pledge would mean that we're not doing that anymore. We're addressing them. Hey, what you said was hurtful. Hey, you shouldn't say that. This is why. Again, it's an educational opportunity in order to create that safe space for everyone. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah. the language specifically is call in uh, as opposed to call out. Call out can be um, sometimes um, seen as shameful or mm -hmm. silencing another voice. Calling in is this idea, again, with the educational component and compassion as well. Like I, I can personally speak as a white male going through all this educational process. I've said some pretty ignorant things and had some pretty ignorant ideas about things. And this learning process has been really formative in my journey as a member of society. Um, so the idea is, again, community coming together, calling people in so we can educate about the issues that are taking place, the harm that's being done, um, and then we can move forward together and learn together. But Lee, okay, I'm just... Say I know Kevin had a hand up, but let me say something, what Kevin just said. It works both ways. You can call me out or in. I could say all white people are racist. And you could say, Shirley, that is not right. That is not correct. Not all white people is racist. See, people forget that it works both ways we, when you're talking <laughs> about diversity. Diversity is just not race and ethnicity anymore. That's 20 years ago. It embraces everything, political, disability. And then you go off into equity and inclusion. In first, it's evolving, it's evolving with us. But you got to remember, in order for us to move toward the society that we want to go to, where everybody is treated equally, we have to all, all of us, we got to call all of us out in whatever you want to say. And I'm shutting up after that because Karen has had her hand up for a long time. Okay, Karen, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Shirley. And uh, thank you. Um, I have so many thoughts about this. I'm only going to say a few. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to applaud the work of the students. You bring me back to the time, and I, I, I came to life, so to speak, in the late 60s and 70s. And by God, if you think you've got activity on the campus now, you should have seen it then. Um, this was this was an age, actually, there was actually, and Mary's, everybody who can relate to that is smiling. We remember. It was a hotbed of activity, and some of it 
truly wasn't peaceful. We had we had a lot of um, violence. Um, and throughout that, the one thought that I had or, or take back is there was, there was always a lot of exchange of ideas. Even with all that was going on, there were free exchange of ideas. Um, on the most conservative campuses, on the most liberal campuses, there was always an exchange of ideas and there was plenty of diversity of thought. If we didn't have a lot of diversity of everything else, we had diversity of thought. So um, I want to just mention that. And, and um, certainly when you're in college, that's the time of when passion and zeal and the opportunity, you're close to each other, you can have plenty of discourse, and it's an exciting time. And I think what you've brought forth is exciting, and it's, and it's of our time and of your time. You're going to remember this when you're 80 or 90 that you worked on this and you brought this forward. Um, uh, now I will tell you, um, I, I've been working, might have used different words, but all my adult life, I've been working for diversity, equity, inclusion, and equality. And used, I'm not going to say what I did and where I was, but to the very best of my ability, I worked toward those things and continue to. Um, so I couldn't be more in favor of all those things and working toward them. Um, I will tell you a great concern that I have just with what's going on in the country. And I don't think the VSC or Vermont is is absolved of this or free of this. At no time in my life have I seen witness people more afraid to speak their mind. And I've heard many from the committee and I sat back and listened and occasionally I'd talk and then I was sorry that I did almost without exception. I attended most of the diversity meetings and most of the time when I spoke, I was sorry that I did and thought, well, I should have just been quiet. Um, I've never witnessed a time in my life when people are more afraid to speak. Um, people, people like the, and it's not just in Vermont. There was an article in the New York Times a couple of months ago about a teacher at an elite New York school who for sure was in favor of diversity, inclusion, equity, equality, and had worked toward that and by all measures was considered to be a pretty good teacher, above average teacher. What he was is a person who dissented. He dissented not with, not with the end result, but with how it was gonna get there. And he was ultimately fired. He was fired because the, some of you are nodding. I think maybe you've read the article. Um, he was fired because the powers that be said that his words were going to confuse the students. Having another point of view wasn't valued because it was educational or show, showed a different route. He was fired because it was going to be confusing. There had to be and I may not be using the right word, but it had to be one thing. Not only do we need to agree on where we're going, but we need to agree on how we're gonna get there. And if you don't agree with me on how we are gonna get there, I'm gonna get rid of you. And I think there are a lot of people, and I've read about this happening in industry on Wall Street. Um, people are afraid to speak. Nobody wants to be called a racist. And if they dis disagree, with a process, they're, they're, uh, they're being challenged as not being with the end result. Um, and I have that concern, not just with the VSC. When I lose sleep at night, and I do, <laughs> part of it is because I worry. I worry about the state of our democracy. If we can't feel free to express an opinion, even at, in this meeting, as to what we really think, then we've got bigger problems than racism or, or sexism or any other kind of ism. 
Um, and, and I would tell you that I'm very fearful of that because when you lose that, it's never in one fell swoop. It's little by little by little by little. Even Hitler was elected. <laughs> you know, little by little by little. You figure, oh, well, this doesn't matter, or it's inconvenient for me to stand up now. I can't stand up now. The price is going to be too high. It really doesn't matter. And before you know it, there's no freedom for anybody. So that's a concern I have. Um, and I'm going to tell you, I dissent. Um, and I'm going to dissent with part of the pledge. Um, and the part of the pledge I dissent with, I think, is unclear. Um, it's unclear about what the call to action is going to look like. If in general terms, we're calling to action to reach a place where all of God's children are treated with inclusion, we have diversity, equity, equality, by God, I'll fight to the death for that. But I don't know what the process is going to look like. And I don't know if the process that's outlined here, because remember, all the faces that are on this screen, we're transitory. All of us could be gone in a month, two months, even the students, you're not going to hang around here. You're going to go off and do something else. But what will be left is whatever we leave in print. And I want to make sure that what we're committing to, we actually can do and actually want to do. I don't want this group think or one think as to how we get somewhere. And I haven't been happy to be quite honest with you with the you know, as we talk about racism, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'm BIPOC. I don't look it. I got blue eyes and pink skin, but I'm BIPOC. 100% of my DNA was targeted or could have been targeted by the KKK in the 20s in this state. So I'm what BIPOC looks like too. And I remember a time growing up in Swanton, and you're going to laugh at this, we had a multimillionaire from Canada who used to, who used to camp on McQuam and, and the local elementary school couldn't come up with money for the band they wanted. They didn't have any instruments. So this man very generously donated a tuba with the proviso that no Catholic child ever put their mouth on it. Now we might laugh at that now, Back in the 50s, the school board was more than happy to take that tuba because they were picking up, up instruments one by one by one. And I could recount all kinds of things. And even back then as a kid, I laughed because it was so stupid. Um, so I'm just telling you that there are instances of racism for sure in Vermont that don't involve black people, that involve Abnakis that involve people of different religious groups. Um, and I've lost my train of thought now. And, and as James Clyburn's father told him, just don't talk too long. And I've already talked too long. Um, I have a thought. And I'm going to lean on something that a past president at Johnson College used to do as a matter of course. My thought is this, my thought is that the VSC family, the group think ought to be more inclusive. Um, Barbara Murphy years ago used to do a, a campus wide book. It was a project every year. And some of you may remember this and I don't know what the process was but they would pick a book and everybody would be given the title of this book staff members, faculty, uh, students, they would read the book. Sometimes the author would come on, on, on uh, campus. They would have various speakers and it was very intense so that the whole campus was involved and unless you were completely absent, you had to be involved in this in some way. And it was a great educational experience, but it was voluntary. I, I, if I were the queen of Siam and I could wave a wand, 
I would reinstitute that or consider reinstituting that. And I would pick books and topics that relate to diversity. That's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is lean on Henry Louis Gates. I'm sure most of you or all of you are familiar with his root, his work in finding your roots. I'm of the opinion that most people don't know what their roots are. And I think it would be very educational and informative. That might be a nice campus-wide project. What are your neighbor's roots? Doesn't matter the color of their skin or their disability or their religion. It might be interesting for them to know their roots, to search and, and get those answers. And it might be a more diverse background than you realize. And I think sharing that would be educational and inclusive. Um, I've been a long time proponent and most of the trustees who've had the misfortune of serving with me have heard me advocate ad nauseum for more foreign language courses and culture to be taught at the VSC. I think if you're serious about diversity and, and global education, you can't do that without foreign language education and culture. I would make a push there. Aside from that, I would tell you that if I jump ahead on the agenda, the mission statement of the Vermont State University says it. The vision statement says it. And I would tell you the Constitution of the United States of America says it and the laws we have in place say it. Are those things perfect? By God, they're not. And as, as a woman who, and believe it or not, I just, just didn't drop here without facing some discrimination and harassment along the, along the way. I know it's not perfect, um, but I think it's better than what's around us. So I think we need to move forward, but I wanna know what we're moving forward to. I don't want us to move forward to, um, there have been lots of societies that had re-education camps or re-education efforts, and some of them didn't end up too well. Um, you know, the, it, was, it was down a road toward authoritarianism. And um, anything that smacks of that, anytime somebody tells me that a whole group is going to take a pledge and that they might not feel free to say no to the pledge, um, I have tremendous hesitation. And I think the cause is good, but I think we need to be, to be careful of where we're going and how we're gonna get there. And I think we truly need to be inclusive. And um, thank you for your time. And I did talk too long. We really appreciate everything you shared with us. You're a great storyteller. It's great listening about your experiences. And I would like to reiterate what is said in our pledge. Um, I can understand hesitancy and a little bit of reluctancy and wanting to move all of this forward. As we have all said, this is far from imperfect, um, just as the constitution and other pledges and policies. This has already been wanted by staff, employees. Um, I could list you so many people across each campus of this institution. So when we look at the call to actions that may seem unclear to you, we would really like to reiterate that these endeavors are already happening, each individually, within departments, so educational departments, psychology, criminal justice, they're happening cross collaboration between departments and campuses because of the new merger, which will be exciting and new. And because of that opportunity where it's exciting and new, this is a chance to make a first step action into something that we are going to continue to work on together. And when we think about inclusively inclusivity, we mentioned students from all cultures, all backgrounds, all heritages. We're not focusing specifically on skin. And so I'm hearing that a lot. And if you read our pledge, we're not 
focusing on that. We want everyone. We want all. It's a we, all of us process. This isn't so much focusing on any one group of people outside of us being one functional community society. This pledge is meant to unify us. So I hope that can offer you a little reassurance into what we're asking for in the call to action is solidifying and openly stating that these we are in support of these actions, which we, the students, are fully aware is already happening. This gives students, staff, employees a chance to sign on and say, we support this. Thank you. And I don't want you to assume that we students the next two months are going to be off doing our own thing. I can assure you we are committed and we are looking forward to the next phases. And we would like the opportunity to continue moving forward and working on this. So we have passionate, compassionate, dedicated, willing individuals that are willing to make this work, which is going to involve grit and energy and effort and hopefully together we will figure this out for all of us. This is meant for all of us. So I just want to stress that when we think of inclusivity, this is for everyone within the Vermont State College system. Thank you, Sabra. Is there anyone else? And I can, uh, I can say on that point, um, I hope that the in the spirit of the pledge that in the respecting and listening to one, one another, we can work together to build a culture of listening to dissenting views, because I, I do believe that that is a really important thing to be able to receive other ideas um, with with compassion and with a willingness to to meet each other and address these issues without saying that these issues aren't an issue, because these there are harms that are taking place that we are agreeing to work on and address. Okay, Tarjay, we spent almost an hour on this. I want you to do this very briefly, please. Okay, I just wanted to say, like, um, in the pledge, we didn't like focus on one group. Um, everyone will will um, will have the um, chance to sign this pledge. Um, it's just this is like the solidarity piece, um, just to show that we stand against racism and we're all a part of the chance to access, accelerate change. Sorry, I'm breaking up. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, is there anything else? Uh, seeing none, I'm going to have a motion to vote to support and adopt the anti-racism pledge proposed by the Student Diversity and Inclusion Task Force as recommended by the DEI committee. Do I have a motion on that? So move, Madam Chair. Okay, Shirley Jefferson has moved. Uh, second? Okay. I'll second okay. it. Okay, Ryan. Okay, any more discussion or questions on the motion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Ask for abstentions, please. Abstentions? One? Okay. All right, we have, um, it has passed. Now we have a second motion. Okay, I'd like to thank the students for coming today. Thank you all for coming. And come, you're so brave to come and talk to us today about a passionate pledge that you have. And I wish you all well, and I'll help you in any kind of way that I can. So thank you all for coming today. Yes. <laughs> yes, we do. Chair, the second item, uh, uh, action item, from the DEI committee is the recommendation to adopt the definition of diversity, equity, and inclusion used by the New England Resource Center for Higher Education, the NECHI, and in its self-assessment rubric for the institutionalization of diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education. Uh, by way of background, the Council of Presidents have approved the use of the rubric as a tool for incorporating DEI into the ongoing transformation work. Following the, re the reception of public uh, feedback, the VF VSC Social Justice Group, uh, they decided to propose the NERCHI uh, definition. And Karen, one of the uh, comments, well, several comments was about 
the definition of diversity because it didn't have political. And even uh, the, the people, the people kept saying, we want to hear a marketplace of ideas, a marketplace of ideas, because the VSC social justice group didn't have that. And so they decided to follow the uh, Nurchi uh, definition and a copy of that definition of diversity, equity, and inclusion is, uh, is on page 21 of the meeting material. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll take it back to you, Madam Chair. Okay, so it sounded like that was a motion from Trustee Jefferson. Uh, it's a motion or a vote to adopt the Nurture definition of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Vermont State College system as recommended by the DEI committee. Is that a motion? So move, yes. A second? Second. Okay, Ryan. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Would you like to discuss this? Well, I want to just say that I, I supported this in the committee and I will support it today. Uh, in looking, rereading the definitions. Um, I'm, I'm not wanting to open up this definition for further uh, wordsmithing today, but I, but I, can't, I, I can't stay silent and say that uh, the, the term gender identity is not included. And that's, mm -hmm. an, that's an incredible, increasingly critical and important piece. Uh, one, in many situations, uh, the laws interpret gender to include gender identity, but we in Vermont, in fact, have separate non-discrimination clauses that include gender identity and some other uh, terms. Uh, I would just like to be on the record as saying that uh, I trust that we are inclusive in that area as well and that uh, we might work with, is it Nurchi? I'm not sure I pronounce it properly, that I looked back for when they, when they adopted this. And I think, frankly, the culture is shifting. And I think if they rewrote this today, it would have the phrase gender identity uh, in it as well, because that has increasingly come to the fore as uh, critically important and something that we have enshrined in Vermont law. So I support this, but I want, I just want to say that I hope that we'll work toward working with Nurchi to update their terms. Okay. Does that mean it does, well, it my reading is includes gender and sexual orientation and that gender identity uh, is sometimes exactly. included under the definition of gender, but in many laws and in Vermont law, we include it separately as gender identity. Okay, well, that, that's interesting. Okay, that's a, anyone else have any comments or any questions on this? I was just gonna ask Bill, do, we, do you want to make that as, a, as an amendment to the motion? I mean, I'm not well, sure. I, don't I, I, I'm just hesitant to, at this point in the process, open it up for you know, the, the conversation of, well, add this phrase, add that phrase. I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable at this point with moving ahead and maybe giving, having the DEI committee think further about whether working with Nurchi is a way to get there or maybe bringing an amendment at a future point in time. But I don't want to try to do that in the middle of our trustees meeting today. I hesitated to bring it up, but I thought, no, I need to at least say something. Uh, and thank you so much. It on the record. It's very important. There is a difference between gender, sexual orientation. A very and, big difference. And gender identity. Yeah. Yes, and it it's is. and 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 it's 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 a very current and very important issue for many, many, frankly, our colleagues, both staff, students, faculty, um, and potential trustees. And I should have caught that bill. Well, I We've got it. We'll, 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 we'll look at it more in the DEI committee, I hope. Okay, Karen. Is that something we can quickly and easily adjust right now? Why wait if it's a... If, I'll if take it as a friendly amendment to that, Sophie. Is that okay? The procedure part? Take it yeah, up. that's why I was asking. I mean, if whether it made sense just to add it as, a, yeah. as, a, as an amendment to the definition. Yeah. I accept it as a friendly amendment. Okay, so we're going to, we have an amendment on the floor. Uh, do we have a second on that? Second. Okay, so we have an amendment to add gender identity to the social differences in the parentheses under diversity. Um, any discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor of adding the amendment regarding gender identity, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we now have the um, motion vote to adopt the Nurture definition of diversity, equity, and inclusion as amended. 
et cetera. Um, everybody agrees on the, the, the motion was made by uh, Shirley Jefferson and seconded by Ryan. Um, any more discussion? No, but I'd just like to thank the VSC Social Justice Group, uh, specifically Hannah <clears throat> Miller, Pat Shine, and Jay Basilier. Thank you so much for working uh, on the definitions. Yes, well noted. Okay. So we're thanking both the, the Social Justice Group and their sponsors um, and advisors. Now, um, all those in favor of... Um, Voting for the motion to accept the nurture definitions, please, as amended, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstains? Uh, that appears that that is taken care of. We now have a report from the Ethical Committee. Uh, <laughs> Trustee Kluver. Right. Can, can, I, can I indulge, Madam Chair, may I make a quick comment, if I may? Sure, go ahead, Bill. Uh, I, I recognize that we've spent much more time than the chair anticipated on this part of the agenda. And having chaired many meetings, I appreciate the pressure that there are for moving through an agenda. But I also really appreciate the amount of time that we took. That I would say, uh, from my point of view, the issue of bringing forward this pledge and these definitions is working because it's engendered a conversation amongst ourselves. And I hope it's a conversation we will continue. Uh, and I think that's, so thank you for indulging, not just really indulging, but uh, allowing the conversation that we needed to have. Thank well, you. thank you. Okay. And we will now move on to the EPSL committee. This is Megan Kluver. Would you like to start, Megan? I will, and I will be brief. So we had a meeting um, about a week and a half ago and heard an update from our faculty and chief academic officers on the progress of the program rationalization. Um, they have moved 69 programs to green status. So green status means that faculty have come together across the campuses and agreed on a path forward, which puts us at the place that that um, path forward now has to go up in through the faculty governance process um, in order to become the programs for the future institutions. So we have 69 green on that path. We also heard with some detail about the 22 programs that are pending um, and had some good information from the chief academic officers and our presidents around some of the roadblocks that those are encountering um, and certainly where they expect to see some progress in the near term. Um, at our next EPSL committee, we'll hear a continued update on those programs and anticipate that we are moving along with good progress at this point. Um, we likely need to have those programs through faculty governance in the May timeline in order to have them in place for the next recruiting process. So update is good progress and tremendous appreciation for our faculty and chief academic officers who are doing the hard work of getting from 250 disparate programs to just about 100 programs that will be offered across the state of Vermont. Any I questions? Will end there, unless there are questions. Thanks, Lynn. Any questions or any discussion on what Epsil's doing? Okay, seeing none. Um, trying to get, trying to work off of. Okay, seeing none, um, we will move on to the uh, update on the COVID-19 vaccination mandate for employees. Uh, Patty Turley and Katrina Meigs, Meigs can report on this. Hi everyone, I'll start. Uh, Katrina and I and, and many others um, across the campuses have been discussing uh, this issue, you may be aware that President Biden is anticipated to mandate for employees of more than 100 the vaccine um, and or some testing if, if someone is exempt from the vaccine. While we wouldn't normally be subject to OSHA, um, because of VOSHA, we expect that we will be subject to this mandate. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know the details, all of the details of it yet. However, what we understand is that uh, all employees, and likely that includes remote employees, will be required to 
provide proof of their vaccine. And if they uh, request and are approved for a medical and or religious exemption, that they will be required to test weekly in order to remain at work. So there's frankly a fair amount of details to work out with that. Um, we've been communicating uh, again with uh, folks um, at the colleges. Uh, we've been uh, speaking with the unions so that people are aware a notice is gonna go out to employees to provide them with some advance warning. We have lots of questions. There are questions about the timeline. We don't know exactly what the timeline will be, but it'll be pretty rapid. It's not going to be many months of, of lead up uh, for compliance. And uh, we just wanted you to be aware that that is happening. I know Katrina would like to um, update you on uh, some of our vaccination information, like we, because we did do a, um, we did do a vaccine survey, as well as talk about some of the other details uh, about how this impacts our work. Thank you, Patty. Thank you all. I think the <clears throat> the biggest piece with this mandate is it's we're, we're sort of in a hurry up and wait um, state. We've been trying to be proactive in a lot of ways. We had done the employee survey. We now know that we've had um, about 70% of our employees have responded. And of those 70%, 97, almost 98% are fully vaccinated. So we're going into this knowing at least that statistic. It still leaves about 30% of our employees, and this is full and part-time that we're unsure of. So we've been trying to line everything up so that when we get this mandate from VOSHA, we're ready to move. Mm -hmm. It's going to create a, a pretty substantial administrative burden just the, the uploading of you know, upwards of 3,000 vaccination records. And then for those who aren't vaccinated, uploading the weekly testing, tracking the weekly testing. So we've been trying to do some research around what tracking mechanisms there are for us to do this and to be able to do it um, as efficiently and effortlessly as possible, just knowing the kind of burden uh, that it's gonna play. But we're trying to stay at least a step ahead of the, the VOSHA um, guidance that should be coming out, hopefully, within the week or two. Okay, and if, any questions, further questions? Yeah, yeah. this is Janet. Um, yeah. So um, why aren't you collecting the vaccination records like yeah. now? Um, you legally can do that. You can have all those records now ahead of the VOSHA rule. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I don't know if there's an opportunity, maybe the legislators in the team know, know better, but the, um, you know, our business is certainly trying to get ready for this. And one of the biggest challenges is the testing, um, the accuracy, the rapid tests, and or the turnaround time of the PCR tests. Um, to the extent the state creates, for lack of a word, better word, a buying group, or the state health department determines what the best rapid test is, that would go a long way. Then everybody trying to figure it out. Um, so I think maybe there's an opportunity to go push on the health department and the governor's office on the testing aspect of this. Cause that, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is far more complicated than the VAX record keeping. Mm -hmm. Janet, if, um, if I may, I, I, I just want to, the, the issue about uh, collecting the vaccine records now, it's simply that we've never done that before. So we have no system to collect employee vaccination records, unlike students where the law has required that we collect vaccine information um, for years and years now, that's never actually been part of our uh, typical employee record. So it is, um, we are working on that. And as soon as we have something up and running, um, we, we, we hope to be able to start collecting uh, the vaccine yeah. records. I would um, tell you that um, it, old school works, right? We've had employees have to take, you know, um, pictures from their phone and send it to HR and it goes in their record there. And I certainly can connect you with our HR person, but, um, old school works. <laughs> uh, it's a little complicated, but at least it gets you ahead of the curve 
on all of this because it is a pain and it is a pain. Yeah, that, that will certainly be a, a big chunk for us to undergo. We are um, communicating with the state about the testing. We also right now, are, we're still in a contract with the Broad Institute who, and they are on campus doing testing um, for our students and, and, and faculty who have, uh, have been requesting or requiring testing. Uh, so we have that at the moment, our, our biggest challenge uh, with the testing uh, is indeed uh, that our road, our, our funding is running out at the end of this year. And frankly, it's a, a, it's a pretty big lift um, to, to have to have that testing available and then have it available in a manner that we, a supervisor can check to make sure that that individual who, uh, who has an exemption, but did they indeed test and upload a negative test this 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 week, it, it, it is um, unfortunately not a, there, we, we haven't found quick answers to that yet, but we are working with the state and in communication with the state about uh, perhaps coordinating with, with some of their resources. Go ahead, Pat. Thanks, just one correction from Vermont Tech, Patty. We have not been uh, having employees do any of the testing. It's only been students. Uh, because we contracted for a certain amount of tests at X dollars and adding employees gonna mean Y dollars. And as you have shared, the money's running out. We don't, we only have certain amount of money, um, certain amount of tests. So, you know, I, you know, the testing does certainly add to the complications, probably a little easier in that we are at least doing those tests every week and we can add employees. It just adds the expense, but the tracking of, what you know, like right now we're testing students, what students have submitted their vaccine proof, what have not, and tracking them down and getting them to go in and take the weekly test. We're actually looking at certain sanctions, maybe putting a hold on their student account to get them to come in to get the test. Will we have that same leverage with employees is a big unknown. And so um, this will be a challenge no matter what for us and every, every employer. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, I should I should know this off the top of my head, but is that what is it about sixty dollars per test ballpark, give or take? Yeah. Yeah, that's my understanding. It it, it can yeah. range anywhere from fifty to sixty sixty five dollars. No. Yeah, I think it works out to that from road with transportation. I think it's twenty five for the test, but the time you factor in um, administering the test, transporting the test, et cetera, you're up in that range, Sean. Yes. You're up Okay. Um, yeah, this is a, this is a huge challenge for all businesses at this point, and it's going to be interesting to see how it evolves. One thing we did uh, at NVRH was, is we ramped up our, our, our program. We put a lot of time and energy into figuring out the policies and what the implications of missing testing would be, for example. Um, and I, I'm sure you're already thinking about it, but, but that required a lot of, a lot of work as well. So Good luck. <laughs> Anyone else have anything to add to this? If not, um, we look forward to hearing more about how this is progressing when you get the next steps done. Um, the report from the Audit Committee on October 18th, we have Trustee Zeller who has a report and a motion. <sighs> Sue, are you there? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I'm getting to my documents here. There it is, board material. Let's see, audit finance committee, item five, yes? Yes. Okay, so. Um, we met and uh, we had a presentation on the audit and also on the um, internal uh, operations review. So the motion is uh, as follows. Whereas the Vermont State Colleges has contracted with O'Connor and Drew to perform the FY 2021 financial statement audit and the auditors have delivered the draft financial statement and 
whereas the board's audit committee has reviewed these materials and recommended that the board accept them. And whereas federal guidance regarding the single audit has only recently been received, therefore, so be it, resolved that the Board of Trustees of the Vermont State Colleges hereby accept the FY 2021 Financial Statement Audit Review Report by O'Connor and Drew, and be it further resolved that O'Connor and Drew will complete the Uniform Guidance Single Audit Report and advisory comments as soon as practicable, and be it further resolved that the completed uniform guidance single audit report and advisory comments will be presented for review and approval by the audit committee of the board of trustees of the Vermont State Colleges at its next regularly scheduled meeting following completion of the report by O'Connor and Drew. Okay, so that's the motion. Do we have a second? The audit committee. Second. Karen, okay, Sean. Okay, is there any discussion or anything? Uh, it sounds like we had a clean bill of health primarily. We did, and as a matter of fact, they commented that they had no comments to make in the management letter, so well, that's very amazing. clean. <laughs> that's, that's truly amazing. Okay, um, any further discussion on that? Okay, we have a motion on the table. All those in favor of accepting the... Uh, why 2021 audited financial statements from the resolution of 2021-023, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Abstain? We've accepted that. Can you go over the, uh, the actual Barry Dunn payroll and benefit internal audit a little bit? What is, what is the status of that? How did that work? Um, is, is Sharon with us? Is Sharon here? Is Sharon here? Absolutely. Okay, I, I, I defer to Sharon for a little more um, precise information. Thank you. Excellent. So O'Connor, uh, Barry Dunn uh, joined us and presented on the internal audit of the payroll and benefits system. The um, audit identified uh, several high priority elements for us to address as part of management's work. Um, and we agree with their comments and we are taking action right now. Several of these things are activities related to uh, the termination of employees and the actions related to doing so, um, processes related to um, really streamlining the work that we are doing. And what we have already started to do is employ um, and deploy the specific uh, software that's available to us already within our payroll system that allows us to have self-service and automated systems that will allow us to be able to improve the compliance and um, our ability to be able to make sure that what we're doing is accurate and correct. Um, there are also a number of low priority items that they also identified. And as we go through the next auditing cycle, we will be providing an update to the audit committee at each meeting to uh, talk to you about our progress on resolving these issues. The great news is, is that Barry Dunn did not find, even though there were high priority items that needed to be addressed, that they did not find that there were any significant errors that required attention. Um, and that's from a lot of due diligence on behalf of the staff, but we really need to automate this work so that um, we know that things can't fall through the cracks instead of um, doing it uh, extensively. And one thing I should mention, I would like to mention is both the auditors and Barry Dunn, high compliments for Sharon and her team on the, uh, the swiftness and accuracy of all the materials that were presented and provided uh, in a remote environment. So kudos to Sharon and her team. Oh, that's good to hear. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Um, we also have a whistleblower uh, hot light update. Um, are we going to hear from Patty Turley on that? Is that something that would be just an update? This is, an, this is a function of the audit committee. We don't usually bring it to the full board, but I mean, I'm sure Patty can provide a, a quick update, but really it's just, again, um, the chair of the audit committee is copied in on all of the ethics point whistleblower complaints. So it's really an opportunity for us just to provide a summary of um, what complaints we've received, uh, just so the audit committee is aware of if there's a pattern or, you know, just sort of some familiarity with what kinds of complaints are coming in. I don't know, Patty, if there was something else you wanted to add. 
No, I would say that primarily um, the amount of complaints that we received were in line with past years and actually the majority of them, six out of nine, related to COVID, mm -hmm. COVID issues, COVID protocol type issues. Um, and from our perspective, they were um, handed off and resolved uh, by folks at the, at the campuses, um, addressed in the best manner that we could. Nothing was left unresolved, let's put it that way. Good. Good. Yes, so no news is good news and whistleblower land. <laughs> good, okay, thank you. Is there anything else that we need to hear about, Susan? I don't think so, unless you, there is a report included um, from uh, uh, the um, Finance and Facilities Committee. Other yeah. than that, um, there's nothing really of, of note there. Um, we received a brief update on the status of capital facilities and equipment and reserves. Um, yeah, we yeah. Some we're going to get into questions. that. Into yeah, we're going to let okay. David and the, and Sharon get into that in finance and facilities. Okay. But yeah. So you're good. That's then. it for audit. You're good to go. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Then we do have the report from finance and facilities. That was on October 18th, that same day. And um, I'll turn that over to Trustee Silverman, and then he can turn it over to whoever he thinks is next best to talk about it. Well, whoever's next on the. Uh, on, on the next square, maybe. Um, so yes, we had a, a meeting of the Finance and Facilities Committee. We really, uh, while we spoke about a lot of things, uh, we, we really could boil them down uh, as looking at uh, the results for fiscal year uh, 2021 and then uh, talked about the strategic uh, financial plan. Um, Looking at uh, results for 2021, um, but for one-time funds, um, the system would have shown a loss of over $5 million for the year. Um, through the uh, good graces of um, the Vermont state government, as well as the federal government, uh, we received $43 million in one-time funds um, some of which were, were spent on directly related uh, uh, costs of the pandemic and some will be used in the future uh, as bridge monies uh, as we work through our transformation. Um, so, you know, rather than focus on the positive, which is not my nature, um, I would focus on the negative, which is we had a deficit, but for... Um, mm -hmm the one-time funds, and I'm gonna say that one more time, we had a over $5 million deficit before one-time funds, lest uh, anybody think that we're, um, you know, we have uh, conquered being financially stable. Now that's, we are on a path for that, but we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, related to that is looking into the future about how we develop budgets, um, in the context of having a more strategic financial plan. And um, I think that you will see a lot of the conversation that we had amongst the committee was creating budgets differently with regards to um, required reserves and capital expenditures, um, keeping up our facilities and so forth. Um, you know, heretofore, uh, we've required pretty modest uh, budgeted reserves uh, on the college level and at the system level, um, and really have not been reserving sufficient monies to leave us with any meaningful financial flexibility with regards to days cash on hand. And as a result, going into the pandemic, um, you know, we were very weak on days cash on hand, which uh, those of you who are in tune with finance know that um, that is a critical measure of, of, of a system or a company's systems, nonprofits viability. And we amongst the committee think it's our responsibility to suggest that in the budgeting process that we over time, um, reserve more on a budgeted basis and thus increasing cash that we hold on our balance sheet so that over the course of time, a time period yet to be determined, but it'll probably by necessity 
be longer than we would like and hopefully shorter than we've done in the past, um, you know, my thinking is probably a 10 year schedule, but that's subject to discussion um, to really get to a point where, you know, the next pandemic doesn't put us in as much of a threat situation as we are, have been going through. Um, and I think this would be good for, not only would it be good for the system, it would be good for the state because essentially the state to an extent has had to step up and make sure that we've remained viable. If we could do that on our own in the next crisis, it would actually be very beneficial to the state as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. How we do that in terms of affordability is gonna be one of our major challenges that we continue to face. Those are two items that are diametrically opposed. Um, Bill, thank you for shaking your head. This is not the first time you've gone through these <laughs> dynamics, I'm sure. Um, so, um, so what we are asking um, the administration to do is to take our conversation and to start to put together some thoughts about some additional policies about how we budget going forward. Um, and my anticipation would be that those would be, from a system point of view, a bit more prescriptive than we have been in, in the past. Um, but we think that that's the direction, at least the finance committee thinks that that's the direction that um, we should be heading. So, I think that's a pretty good summary of our meeting, but Sharon, um, if you would like to uh, either correct anything I've said wrong, or if you have any other thoughts um, on the meeting and its content, please share. Uh, you did an outstanding summary, and I don't have anything further to add other than to say that we're really looking forward Tomorrow, the Business Affairs Council is actually digging in and really starting to look at our, the existing policies and where we need to head. Um, we got some great information from the Finance and Facilities Committee about directions and directions the board may wish to go. And we're really looking forward to bringing those back to you soon. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, Madam Chair, I uh, yield back to you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very good summary. Um, as a member of the Finance and Facilities Committee, I found the um, reports that are that were built very similar to the ones we heard at the retreat to be very, very um, eye-opening. They were also very sobering. And I would recommend, there were some members of our, of our committee who were not there, but I would recommend to everyone on the board to get a chance to go back to YouTube and see if you can observe and read and listen or whatever, the things that were discussed. Um, it was a very instructive finance committee meeting. It presented materials that I've never seen presented to us before, except maybe at the retreat a little bit. And I think that we really do have, um, it would be really instructive for others, all the others that don't normally go to that committee to listen to it because it would really help us all understand uh, what we really need to do going forward. It's, uh, it was a very sobering uh, committee meeting. And I think that David outlined it very well. Anything else on that? Any questions? Okay, seeing none on that, we don't have any action on that. We do have a mission and vision statement for the Vermont State University. Um, we do have a motion for this and we need Provost Nolan Atkins to give us some report on this. It's in your, it's in your uh, packet, so you should be able to pull that up. Okay, thank you. Yes, it's actually easy to find because it's the very last page of your board materials. Just, just scroll right down to the bottom. You'll see both statements there. So yeah, thank you. And um, I'm here to give you an update of the vision and mission work since the board retreat at Lake Maury. Uh, the update is essentially the vision and mission statements that you see on the last page of the, the board package. Um, I, I just want to start by 
stating that I've been working with a small group of individuals on the vision and mission. And I'd just like to call them out because um, it's, this is a cross-institutional group that have put a great deal of time and effort and creative energy into the statements that, that are before you for your, your consideration. Uh, and the individuals who have been working on this include Mary Beth Lennox Levins and Emily Wysalis at Castleton, James Noyes and Sylvia Plum at NVU, and Jessica Van Duren and Sarah Billingsburg at Vermont Tech. I've really appreciated working with this group and the creative energy has, has just been, in a, been amazing as we've uh, put these two statements together. So since the, the board retreat, uh, we have essentially uh, received additional input and feedback on the keywords, concepts, uh, and phrases that I presented to you at Lake Maury um, and just gave an oral recitation about uh, those concepts. So we've received additional feedback from faculty, from Vision Point, and then through the series of transformation town hall meetings that we had across the system. Based on the refinement of those ideas that I presented at Lake Maury, based on those inputs, uh, this working group has uh, began the, the task of drafting the vision statement. We started with the vision statement and we employed some very simple design principles when thinking about the vision statement. Uh, we, first of all, uh, have included, we believe, all of the important concepts that were presented and discussed at that Lake Maury meeting. Uh, we intentionally have written the vision statement to eliminate higher education jargon. So you'll remember that mm -hmm. many times during that meeting in Lake Maury, I referred to applied learning as a pedagogical approach that we would infuse in degree programs. So we, we talk about applied learning in the vision statement, but we just don't refer to it as applied learning because we want to ensure that the vision and mission statements, which will be read by a variety of audiences are in fact understandable by a variety of different audiences. The other thing that, that sort of guided our work is to be concise. It was important for us to, first of all, ensure that all of the important concepts are clearly articulated in the vision and mission statements. Uh, but we didn't want to make it um, uh, so concise that we neglect important concepts and ideas. And so we really strove for a balance of conciseness versus ensuring that everything that we feel like is important for creating this new institution is there. And that was really an important guiding principle. And that is, we feel that the vision statement guides this transformation work. And so all of those important ideas needed to be articulated in the vision statement. Uh, and we believe they do. Other vision statements are shorter, others are longer, but we feel like uh, with what we've created, um, the vision statement that we're putting before you uh, does have all of the important pieces that will guide the ongoing transformation work. Uh, once the vision statement was written, we then wrote the mission statement. Uh, and, and so that's how we created that. Again, we were striving for uh, conciseness and yet ensuring that all of the important pieces are in the mission statement. Uh, once we had drafts of the vision and mission, we then uh, uh, reached out and considered feedback from the Council of Presidents, from Vision Point, and from uh, Jim Page. And so their thinking is also reflected. Their thinking actually greatly improved. Uh, what we put before you now. The final point that I want to make is an update since the last board meeting that we believe these, that the vision and mission statements actually, we believe they complement very nicely the system mission statement and also the mission and vision statements of the Community College of Vermont. And I think that is important because moving forward, it will be these two institutions working together in a complementary way to realize the mission of the system. And from our perspective, we believe the vision and mission statements before you do that. 
So with that is preamble, I would uh, happily entertain any questions. Any questions on this? Okay. Uh, there is a motion that needs to be made. It's a motion to approve the mission and vision statements for Vermont State University as set forth in the meeting materials. I need a motion on that. Lynn? Yes, go ahead, Karen. Um, I, I'd like to move the adoption of the mission and vision statements as presented. And I, I make that motion with pride and gratitude. Very well done, thank you. Okay, we need a second on that motion. Adam, we'll second that. Okay, Adam, thank you. So we have a, a motion and then a second on the table. Any further discussion or questions of Nolan Atkins? I guess seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the Vermont State University mission and vision statements as presented, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Aye. Um, everybody said aye, right? <laughs> any op opposition? I don't believe there is any. Okay, Nolan, thank you very, very much. That looks like a very good step forward. Thank you. Bill. Lynn? Well, let me go to Bill first, and then we'll go to the whoever next. I, I would just... Uh... I would just request that uh, if we could have the vision and mission statements of the VSCS, Everything. the state proposed Vermont State University and CCV all in one document that can be shared with us as trustees. I mean, I, I can go looking for it, but I think it'd be really great yeah. to have, as, as uh, Nolan indicated that they fit together. It'd be nice to be able to be able to see them all in one place. If, you could, if that could be shared with us, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. We can get that to you, no worries. Thank you. Yes, anyone else have anything to say? Lynn, Go ahead, Mary. On a different matter, I don't believe we voted to accept the financial statements during that part of the meeting. We, I don't think we have financial statements to approve at this point in time. The finance committee, uh, maybe there, David- There was a resolution in the packet. No, that was no, for accepting we, the audit. We accepted okay. the audit. Just, yeah, we yeah. did the audit. Yeah, did we, this was did we vote on that. We yes, did we vote did. on that. All right, yeah. sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah. So we, yeah, the finances was just a report. Okay. So we've got we've got the mission and vision statement. We've approved that, and I think Sophie or someone from the administrative offices can send us copies of those so we can read them all together. Thank you. Okay, now we have a trans transform transformation update. We've got our uh, project manager, Wilson Garland, who is going to give us a report on this. Go ahead, Wilson. Thank you. And I just have, I have a quick update, but I wanted to update you on some important uh, progress that we've been continuing to make on transformation. Um, we're quickly reaching an important milestone for the student experience and the academic operations team. Uh, we're concluding, concluding our discovery stage and those teams will be presenting their findings as well as their recommendations for design principles to the sponsors uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, the discovery stage for the administrative operations uh, core team and, and sub teams is continuing and will continue through the end of the year. Uh, we've also kicked off the workforce development uh, teams and are moving into discovery now with that group and working on some key uh, development items there that I'll update in a few minutes. Um, and then we have several key deliverables needed for the design and development work that are on track. Uh, we just talked about the mission and vision and that's an important element that informs all the work that we're doing with transformation. And along with that, the, the DEI work that we talked about earlier is also uh, being embedded within the transformation work that we talked about. Uh, the, the program array work is progressing um, and towards the, the governance approval process. And that's an important step along the way that is helping to inform the work that we're doing across all the teams. And then the naming and branding initiative for Vermont State University is continuing to move ahead and we'll have uh, future updates on that at future meetings. In terms of risks and dependencies that are inherent in the process that we're going through, um, 
some of the, the things that uh, we've changed since we talked, we've uh, decided to accelerate the submission of the substantive change proposal to the accreditor, uh, NECHI. Uh, we have continuing capacity concerns related to making sure that we can get all of the programs and, and other items through the faculty governance and approval process. And um, mm -hmm. I know that the chief academic officers and others are working closely with faculty to make sure that we can get that done and, and make sure that that happens. We've also identified a continuing need for additional technical expertise and capacity um, in areas where our staffing and resources are thin. Um, so an example of that would be in the learning and enterprise systems area. And so we're looking at some backfill uh, support and, and, and potentially some, some contract support in those areas, uh, as well as making sure that we have our processes aligned uh, for our systems configuration and programming that will come out of the design work. So. Um, in effect, we're, we're really focusing our efforts on getting prepared for the design and development work that will come into the next phases. Just a, a quick update on each of the different core teams, uh, areas that we're, we're working on in academic operations. We're nearing completion on the discovery stage. We're integrating the DEI principles into the discovery work with the NERCHI framework that was discussed earlier. Um, and the sub teams really are focusing on student success um, access and best practices as we move through discovery. Uh, our priorities are to finalize the design principles for the discovery gate. And that's, as I said, um, gonna be concluding here in the next few weeks. Uh, we have an evaluation of the array for cost and mission as we've talked about in EPSL and other places. Uh, we know that we will need some additional professional development regarding uh, modalities and, and our DEI priorities and then uh, working on the general education curriculum for Vermont State University was one of the top priorities moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. As I mentioned in the earlier slide, uh, the capacity of governance structures to process the evalu evaluation of programs and policies is a core area of focus for us as we move ahead. And the complexity of merging and supporting schedules across the various programs and institutions is a an area that will require some technical expertise as well as making sure that we've got the um, functional and system support to enable that. Um, and then just the scope of the development needed in systems and technologies, particularly around delivery modalities is an area that we're focusing on for um, academic operations. For student experience, uh, this team also is, is coming to the end of discovery. Um, also working on integrating DEI principles through the, the NERCHI framework um, and then continuing to work on the brand pillar development that we've talked about for uh, the branding. Um, priorities looking ahead really are to conclude the discovery process as well as aligning the functional resources to, pre uh, to prepare for the design stage and then launching the Vermont State University microsite. Um, while that's not in the immediate offering is something that we're, we're definitely working diligently on so that we'll be ready for that when, when we're ready. Um, in terms of issues and dependencies, really just recognizing that there's significant system dependencies across the teams and the capacity needed to complete the design stages at the forefront of our minds with this group. As I mentioned, administrative operations has a little bit longer on their discovery process because we have staggered the work to ensure that we have the capacity to manage it, uh, but we have kicked off the core teams and the sub teams um, and, and they're working on their charters. Uh, looking ahead, uh, we've identified some, we need to identify some key dependencies across the processes and teams. There's a lot of interplay between the back end processing work that happens in this group and then the front end student uh, processes that impact student experience and academic operations. So we're working on those. Um, and then really looking at what systems needs we have to support the transformation through discovery. In terms of dependencies, uh, we know that we're gonna need some additional people and resources in targeted areas to ensure that we have the capacity to support the discovery and design work across all of the transformation initiatives um, and just recognizing the significant time and system dependencies that exist with the other teams. So those are the areas that we're focused on specifically for administrative operations. And then the final core process area where we have a, a team approach is workforce development. And this group, as I mentioned, just uh, kicked off uh, within the last couple of weeks and has begun to establish objectives and deliverables for their work. Um, and they're kicking off the discovery stage uh, right now and, and getting deep into that work as well. Uh, one of the first things though that we need to do now that we've 
identified the objectives and deliverables is working on our high level timeline of the different stages. And so um, I don't have any details on that at this point because we're still uh, developing that, but we will have that for you in a future update. Um, and then we're also looking to make sure that we've identified the key dependencies across the other processes and teams. Um, for example, a lot of the systems that we plan to use for workforce development will overlap with systems that are used in admissions and other areas so that we want to make sure that we've got alignment of those systems and requirements as we move into design and development. Um, and that's really the, the focus of the issues and dependencies is really identifying what those dependencies are and, and what areas we need to align. Um, and then importantly, um, while workforce development was the last of the teams to kick off, we want to make sure everyone's aware that it's not um, secondary in importance. It's really very important to the overall mission of uh, not just Vermont State University, but the VSC overall. Um, and we just want to make sure that as we go through this transformation work, that that importance is not only recognized, but integrated within the broader work that's happening across mm -hmm. the system with transformation. So this is uh, an updated of, uh, chart of the, the schedule that we've looked at before. You can see student experience and... So Wilson, yeah. there's no, we're not seeing anything. I don't know if you had, if you... Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, well, um, I will make sure that these slides get out to everybody and, and uh, unless you would like me to do a quick summary from the, from the top, Sophie. No, that's fine. If you if yeah, if you provide them afterwards, we can include them as supplemental okay. meeting materials, and I can send them around to the trustees as well. So if you send them to me afterwards, we'll be all set. Right. I apologize for that. Hopefully that's all right. I, I should have noted before. I wasn't sure because you kind of referenced maybe there was something on the screen, and I, I wasn't yep. entirely sure. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, this is the at the high level uh, timeline and and chart that we have across the different. Uh, core teams, and we will add workforce development once we've established yeah. our yeah. milestone timelines. Um, and then finally, just some questions and considerations for the board as we move ahead on the on the transformation work. Um, we want to make sure if there are any additional items as we go ahead and, and do additional updates in the future, uh, please let us know what um, items you'd like some more additional information on. Um, one of the things that we're cognizant of as we move through the transformation is constantly making a, a trade-off in, in terms of the speed with which we can save money in the short term versus uh, establishing a foundation for the future. And, and so that's something that we're continuing to work through and, and would certainly like some guidance from the, the board on that. Um, and then finally, at the, at the retreat we had presented, uh, an update of, of the accountability uh, dashboard and I identified some priorities for, for us in terms of moving forward on that um, and just wanted to uh, get some feedback if there was any from the, the board on those priorities. And if not, uh, we should move ahead. So those were the, the items there. Yeah, uh, this is Janet, I have a question. Um, and I think we brought this up in the last meeting is when you talk about things like resource and timing trade-offs, um, cutting costs versus foundation, how are you bringing those forward for us to see what choices it, either we have to make or already are being made that maybe aren't normal purview of the board? Um, right. But I, um, I'm still concerned about decision making and either transparency of it or what we should be helping with versus what's happening behind us. Thank you, that, that's very helpful. And I, I will say that um, right now we're in, in the discovery stage where we're raising what those uh, different design principles are that we'll be putting forward to the sponsors and, and other stakeholders. Uh, when we get through the next phase, which will be the design phase, uh, the, that is the point at which we'll be making uh, more of the specific trade-offs about which things we prioritize and move ahead with. 
uh, which things get um, either delayed or post postponed to a later phase. Um, and so we'll have more that we can present as we get through that phase and, and, and that stage um, in terms of what trade-offs that we have on our, on our plates. Um, but that's a, a good uh, thing to raise and we will certainly uh, try and be as transparent as possible about those decisions uh, when we get to that point. Anyone else have questions? Adam, and then Megan. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay? I'm having connection yes. issues. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm curious if the uh, earmark, the Senator Leahy earmark for workforce is being targeted for transformation work or if that's a, a different focus and would be uh, curious to hear about that either under transformation or if it is indeed a uh, different focus at a later point. I don't know to whom I'm addressing that question, um, maybe between the two, uh, Sophie and um, Wilson, if you might try to answer that for me. Yeah, good question. It, it certainly would assist us with transformation. At the moment, we don't we don't know if we're going to get it. So we're still waiting to see, right? It, it moved out of committee into a Senate appropriation bill. So we have our fingers crossed on it. Um, but there are specific things in there that would help uh, with transformation of libraries, um, institutional research and workforce development. So that would certainly be something we could look at um, as part of this. And I know Sharon was involved um, in, um, in submitting the earmarks. I don't know, Sharon, if there's anything else you wanted to add. No, really, we, um, when we designed the earmark request, it was really looking at what are some of the needs that we're anticipating as we move forward with transformation in order to be able to extend the transformation and be able to reap the benefits faster, potentially. Um, we know that we have these specific needs that Sophie just mentioned. Um, transformation, the dollars that we have to be able to do that will help us do a lot of things. But as Wilson noted, we are going to have to make trade-offs and this will allow us to be able to continue to perform that work and make fewer of the trade-offs that will have to be done for cost reasons if we're able to achieve it. Great. Thank you. Megan? Thanks, um, Wilson, I think you reference among the risks compa capacity constraints and, and resourcing constraints for the team. We've heard this consistently. There's just not enough people to do the volume of work. Faculty are stretched, staff are stretched. And I, I, I'm worried that this is just going to become sort of the punctuation at the end of the sentence and we're going to accept this and, and sort of keep going. As you move into design, or maybe you've done this now, can the team articulate, you know, what are the resources that are needed and where are we falling short? And maybe what are the what are some solutions that could be proposed? Or to Janet's point, what are the trade-offs that we're accepting because of those capacity constraints? No, that's a that's a very good question. And I think um, as we've looked, you know, so as we've gone into discovery, it's really been trying to get clear on what uh, we're including in design. So we're, we've been looking at what are our design principles for the various processes and, and services and programs and, and other things that we're going to, going to offer. But we know once we move into design, it's going to be more time intensive in terms of really getting to the very detailed level of the different processes and systems and so on. So as we've been going through discovery, we've been looking at specific areas of uh, whether they be ERP or scheduling software or other areas where we know we're going to need to invest some time and resources to determine if we have the right expertise in-house or if there's some additional expertise that we need to bring uh, to bear on that. So um, uh, Kelly Campbell and, and uh, Doug Eastman and I and others have been actively engaged in thinking through what sorts of technical resources we need combined with the other functional resources we need and recognizing also though that a lot of the functional experts that we have or are in the uh, various institutions that belong to VSC. And so um, we've been working with the presidents and others to make sure that we have the right people identified and that um, are also looking for what additional resources we might need to deploy there either as backfill resources or additional 
um, temporary hires or, or contractors or others to make sure that we have uh, those things in place. Um, I'd say this is a, an area of active discussion for us and, and we're certainly not waiting till we get to design to understand what those areas are. At this point, um, we don't see any uh, issue with the overall timeline, but certainly time and, and resource and, and expertise is, uh, are sort of the tension points as we get into that work. Can someone please define what ERP is so that we understand Sorry. it's been mentioned in the past and it is important and it's- yep. So ERP is just the, the enterprise system uh, and, and really we have a, a constellation of, of systems that are sort of our core system. So for example, a student, the student information system is at the core of what we offer. And then there's other systems that surround that. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Kelly would like to jump in and, and provide a little bit more detail about that. But when we talk about ERP, it really refers to enterprise resource planning, which is a type of system that integrates all of those different aspects of an enterprise. Kelly? Yeah, thank you, Wilson. And Megan, I want to thank you for your question because it's one that it's keeping me up late at night, right? It's it's a very, very important question. I think um, I'm, I'm speaking from the technology lens here, but um, many of these systems that we use, including our ERP, which as um, as Wilson just explained, if you, if you think of our enterprise systems as, as an octopus, right? Colleague, which is our ERP, is kind of at the center of that. And then we have systems mm -hmm. wrapped around it, right? So we have a lot of data flowing between systems and different users of those systems. Um, and it, I think the perspective we need to take as we go through this process is to really understand what systems and processes and people do we need to really invest in, in, in the short term over the next two years, knowing that there's going to be some systems that we might have to band-aid or do slight modifications to and start to address them long-term. So I think this really starts to roadmap our short-term versus our long-term technology strategy and being sure that the systems that we invest in support the new business process that we're establishing. Um, so I, in my mind, as we look at kind of the complexity of our IT strategy, I think that's that's just something to keep in mind as we're looking over the next two years, but we're also, we got to look five to seven years out as we build this strategy as well, because we're just not going to simply be able to do it all in the next two years, right? So uh, prioritizing that work is really, it's exciting from an IT perspective that we have the structure of transformation and we have the structure that's come into play from discovery and then design to be able to kind of wrap around our strategy around that, right? Um, so hopefully that helps just explain a little bit um, some of our thinking. Megan, do you want to? Uh, the other item just to follow along and answering your question, Megan, is when we look at the resource constraints, the first step to being able to address the risk is to identify it and to really identify the extent of that risk. So we're very much keeping an eye on it because we don't want that to be the punctuation mark at the end. It really needs to be something that we address up front. I would, I would just add to that um, we just have coming on board in a week, two weeks, uh, we have a business and process analyst, which was a position that we had been um, seeking to hire some time ago, but we do have um, someone coming on board that we're very excited about um, in a couple, I think two weeks on Monday, a week on Monday, anyway, very soon. So that will help. Megan, have you have anything else to ask? A comment on. No, thank you very much. Yeah, my understanding is that colleague has been around a while and it's it has had a lot of changes made to it over the period of time we've had it. And that's part of our ERP planning short term concerns because we can't continue to do that. It's hard, it's hard to keep up with it, it's hard to customize it it's been customized so much it's ridiculous so am i correct in that in a very basic <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes that that's not a far off statement i you know i think we've had colleague in our environment for oh 20 years now we have added layers of complexity to it by design um and now we have to unravel that and um for anyone sitting in my seat, you know, a lot of colleagues that I'm talking to um, beyond the Vermont State Colleges right now uh, has emphasized the opportunity we have ahead of, ahead of us. Um, there, this, is, this is not uncommon in many higher ed organizations around ERP strategies, and we have a real opportunity now to really um, 
align on our business process and, and conduct our business in a really new way. And I think the structure of transformation is giving us a really powerful, powerful vehicle to do that work. And by prioritizing that work and then wrapping our technology around it, I think it will, um, we will be well served and we will have a much more sustainable long-term strategy for us. Thank you. Is there anyone else with any questions on the process of the uh, transformation and the project management? If not, we can go to additional business. Additional business, I don't know if anyone has any, but if you do, please speak up now. Not hearing anything. Um, public comment. Uh, Jen, do we have anyone who has signed up for public comment? We do not, Chair Dickinson. Uh, if there's anyone here on the Zoom that would like to raise their hand for a comment, please do so now. Okay. I see Beth has come on camera. Beth, do you have something you'd like to say? Yeah. Yeah, I um, thank you for all of your hard work on all of this. It's appreciated. Um, the transformation work is something that has been uh, taking time, and but it's time well spent. Um, but I just want to remind folks that when we talk about contractors and temporary staff to address our resource constraints, we do have to pay attention to our various uh, contract agreements, bargaining agreements. So just a reminder that we have to pay attention to what our contracts say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Beth. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, uh, we have an executive session. I'm going to read a motion uh, that the Board of Trustees enter executive session pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A3 to discuss, discuss the appointment and employment of a public officer. No formal or binding action shall be taken in executive session. Along with the members of the board present at this meeting and the in its discretion, the board invites Steve Leo and Matt Bunning, Bunting of Starbeck, Storbeck Search, the chancellor and the chief financial officer and operating officer to attend. Um, would someone like to make a motion to that effect? We need a motion. So moved. Thank you, Sean. A second on that? Second. Okay, thank you. And that, um, so we will be entering oh, any discussion. Seeing none, um, all those in favor of going into executive session as outlined, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, we are entering executive session at 3.04. Uh, we're going into the breakout room. Okay. Okay. I think we're back in session. Uh, we're out of executive session at um, 4.15 or 18. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Mary's, uh, anyone else want to move to second that? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in uh, support of adjourning, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, thank you very much, everybody. We will see you sooner than we think. <laughs>